Um, hey everyone, thanks so much for joining today. My name is Caroline and I work on the marketing team here at The Good. We're so excited about the e-commerce experts we've gathered here and the session that we've got ready for you. So today is all about how to win Q4, specifically Black Friday and Cyber Monday. We know it is only August, but this team is here to answer the question, what should you be doing now to deliver an end-to-end -end purchasing journey that drives sales during those crucial e-commerce events? So just really briefly, I'm gonna introduce our presenters. First up, we have Dylan Kelly, founder and CEO of Wavebreak, who will be sharing how to maximize Q4 email success and drive traffic with email marketing. Dylan, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Uh, I think we, I think I've done podcasts with both Cart Hook and The Good before, like over the years. So we have a really awesome lineup today. I'm really excited to dive in. Um, and yeah, we don't have a lot of time until Black Friday will be here. So uh, this is a really, re really important training. So I'm excited to, to dive in today with, with you all. Nice. All right. And next we have John McDonald, founder and CEO of The Good. We'll be covering tactics on how to convert more site visitors into buyers. John, thanks for helping put this all together and, of course, for joining us today. Of course. So all the credit goes to you, Caroline, for, for <laughs> making all of this happen. So thank you. Appreciate it. All right. And then finally, we have Emily Foreman, CEO of Carthook, who will share strategies on how to boost AOV with post-purchase offers. Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to kind of talk about post-purchase strategies. Cool. All right, so we have a lot of valuable content packed into this hour, so let me share my screen and pass things off to Dylan to get us started, but please feel free to put any questions in the chat because we'll have a live Q&A at the end of this session. All right, and with that, we can go ahead with Dylan and email marketing that drives traffic. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Caroline. Um, Really excited to dive in today. Um, we're already in August, time flies, and it's 2021, right? I feel like since March of last year, time has just flown by, uh, which is why this is really important because today, what I'm gonna be talking about in my talk is how to maximize Q4 email success. And what's the key part of maximizing Q4 email success is it has some to do with what emails you actually send during the holiday season, but a lot of it actually has to do with what you do before to prepare and to get your list primed and ready to go. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is some key principles that you can follow while also navigating this wrench that kind of got thrown at us that's coming around Q4, uh, which is iOS 15. So if you don't know what that is and how it applies to email, I'll be diving into that uh, to start. Um, but in general, um, we're gonna be talking email, what you can do to have a really great Q4 this year. So iOS 15, this is the elephant in the room when it comes to email right now. Um, so first things first, I wanna cover what exactly is happening and what we currently know about iOS 15, and then what you can do to prepare and continue to have success with email marketing as we get closer to Q4, um, and what you can do to uh, just navigate the change. So what is exactly happening? Long story short, Apple's rolling out mail privacy protection for their mail app on iOS 15. It's expected to happen sometime between September to November. So right in that prime, like pre-Q4 or potentially in the middle of Q4 window, which is really not the best timing, but that's what we're gonna talk about today is how you can build a program around real segmentation and personalization. So this doesn't really affect you in a major way. And to summarize what that actually means, the biggest thing is just opens are no longer gonna be able to be tracked on Apple Mail. We're assuming that Gmail and other providers are gonna follow suit because security is top of mind for everybody right now, um, especially with tracking and things like that. So we're losing opens, which for a lot of brands who segment based on opens, um, you know, that's a pretty big deal. You're not gonna be able to segment as effectively. Uh, Apple Mail users are also gonna be able to hide their IP address. So if you have a uh, you know, retail part of your business and, and digital's one, part of your business, you want to target people uh, with retail. If you don't collect their location, you're not going to be able to use their IP address in targeting. Uh, and then iCloud subscribers are going to have the option to hide their email addresses when signing up for email lists. The last one is kind of the least important. Um, you know, there's some different workarounds that you can have, like on opt-ins, like you, you're going to potentially be able to block those. I think we've also tried to sign up for a lead form at some point and they block the personal Gmail, um, you know, even though that's like a better email for <laughs> any sales rep to get a hold of. Uh, but there's some things that you could do with that. Uh, but the biggest thing is like open rates aren't going to be able to be tracked. So it's going to affect segmentation. Um, 
And so resends are going to be impacted. You're not going to be able to use as many quick win tactics. You're going to have to focus on real long-term strategy, which is what we will dive into today. And so what does this actually mean? Ultimately, you shouldn't be worried about iOS 15. As long as you adapt, your email revenue isn't going to be going anywhere. And it's a big opportunity for brands to evolve their email programs to be a more powerful revenue driver by focusing on actual strategy and not just tactics. Um, so back to the open rate example, uh, if you're just using open rates and segmenting by people who have based on or who have opened an email in the last X days, like that's great. It keeps your open rates high, keeps engagement high. Uh, but at the same time, it's just a lazy form of segmentation. And so we'll get into what to do instead and how to deliver more personalized emails at scale um, throughout the rest of my talk. And so the good news with all of this is that really open rates don't equal success in your email program. Really success comes down to revenue. And then before you like get freaked out or like, oh, like we're just optimizing for revenue isn't good. Um, that's not exactly what I mean because you have to actually understand where revenue comes from, which ultimately comes from delivering a really great customer experience and getting people to actually love your emails. Um, so what we find is with our clients, the, the, the brands who have emails that are actually loved by their clients drive a lot more revenue from those. And I'm sure John would agree too, like the better your customer experience, the more revenue you end up driving. So if you're really focused on revenue, it's not about short-term quick win tactics, but it's about long-term strategy that's actually smart and treats people like they're human, um, which, which John will get to in his presentation. But how do we apply that methodology to the email channel? Well, before we dive into that, I want to go over a quick example of what happens when you shift your mindset around emails from, qual uh, from quantity to quality. So this is two real world examples. Um, so we've got brand A, brand B, both have the same list sizes. Brand A sent daily emails for the past three years and brand B sent four emails a month for the past three years. And the difference here, similar average order value, same list size. They're pretty much identical brands. It's just uh, somehow we just happen to onboard these brands within the last year together. Um, so we've been able to look at the data and it's really interesting. So brand A off their daily sends was averaging one to $3,000 a send, which puts their monthly email revenue from calendar sends at about 60,000 uh, per month. And then the brand sending four emails a month averages about 30,000 to 50,000 per send with their monthly email revenue from sends about 160,000 a month. And so they're sending significantly less email but driving a lot more revenue. How is that possible? Well, that's what I'm going to go over today. They're sending better emails and not sending more emails. And so what I'm going to cover today is three strategies that you can steal to have your customers saying, I love brands emails. And this works before, during, and after Q4. And if you want to have a successful Q4, what needs to happen is you really need to focus on warming and priming your list now. And you can see in that last example too, like the brand that actually really cultivated great relationships sent quality content over the course of years, their revenue was significantly higher from email than the brand that was focused on just the quick wins and seeing how many emails we can send. And so what does that actually look like in practice? So strategy number one, personalization. I don't think this is talked enough about in emails. We have ads that follow us around, but very rarely are brands really personalizing their emails, even at scale. So an example of that is Eddie Bauer. Um, you know, love Eddie Bauer, they've been around very long time, as you can see with their 100 years logo, uh, but they're emailing like, you know, it's, it's 100 years ago, which is if you look at this, you think of a, uh, of a brand like Eddie Bauer, who has millions of people on their email list, been around <laughs> over 100 years. And if you look inside this email, all the content that they have can really be sent to anybody. They've got shop for women, shop men, and we couldn't even fit the entire email in this, but then they get into their kids section and everything. And what we recommend is not just trying to cram as many messages in a single email, but really understanding who's actually on your list and who the best customers on your list are. So in this case, like maybe Eddie Bauer analyzes their list and they realize that their top customers are, are the women and they do buy for their kids. Well, you should be sending personalized content around those. Um, and I have another Eddie Bauer example, like further in the presentation that we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but ultimately, you don't wanna send non-segmented emails. You wanna send really targeted messages you end up driving way more revenue um, and delivering a better experience. So what should you do instead? Well, you want to segment your emails to deliver a personalized, ex personalized experience, which is going to drive increased conversions. Uh, so for our clients, we have them seeing 30 to 50% conversion rates after we send email traffic to the site after running these programs for a very long time or for not that, much, uh, for not that long of a time. 
And then inside of that, personalizing the content of your emails for the subscriber. And then a bonus tip that makes your email seem more personal is using current pop culture to make your content feel even more personal and less marketing. It feels like it's a post in your social media feed from a friend or like you're just scrolling through Instagram stories or something and less like your brand and you end up developing a real connection with your customer base. So when you go to launch your Black Friday sale, they're already engaging with your emails and they love getting your emails and they're more likely to open them and then buy when their inbox is full of Eddie Bauer emailing them three times a day, the same offer over and over again. And so here's a tactical example from Ballsy, who's a really cool, cool brand. We've been optimizing their program for a while now. And so these emails are really personalized. For one, people are getting a different email, whether they're a rewards member or not. Two, we're um, really timely with how we're referencing culture. So this was sent out, I believe, back in June uh, when Bitcoin was starting to go down after it had a really great run. Um, and, and our creative was Ballcoin is booming while Bitcoin goes up and down. Ballcoin is forever inserted their current balance. So that's personalized too with how many points they actually had. And we have the to the moon CTA, uh, which did really well. But if you're not in the uh, rewards program, that doesn't make sense as content to get. And so we send a different creative to uh, incentivize people to join the program and get their first rewards points going. Because that's another piece is you could have a great rewards program, but if it takes a while to accumulate points and you're not getting those people, those initial points, they have no reason to make that next purchase, um, which you can incentivize also without using discounts or other things that are cut into your margin come Q4. And this doesn't just apply to your one-off email sends or campaigns. This also applies to your automated email sequences. So I wanted to take you behind the scenes of a 35 million a year email and SMS program that we run for a brand. It takes a lot of resources to do this, but it's incredibly effective. What we do is we update their flows monthly to increase urgency and ultimately conversions. So when Black Friday, Cyber Monday rolls around, we're delivering a personalized welcome series and we're including that sale end date in there. We're triggering abandoned cart and rouse abandonment emails that are sale specific. You know, so often brands are trying to come up with false urgency and all these excuses to get people to buy. Yet when they actually have urgency and a real reason for people to actually convert, they don't utilize that in their marketing messaging as well as they should. Specifically on the email channel, we find too. So if you want to scale your program to next level and drive even more revenue from email, it goes beyond just how many emails you send on Black Friday. And also it's the, the triggered sequences. So what happens when someone abandons cart? When does your Black Friday sale end? Include that information. We find significantly increases uh, email revenue during the holiday season. Strategy number two is creative. Uh, creative is super important. Um, I think we can all agree. So back to our good old Eddie Bauer example. This is an example of what not to do. So they're emailing every single day. And if you look, this is two weeks of emails zoomed out. Pretty much the same creative every single day. And if you zoom out even a month, they pretty much ran the same creative for an entire month. Um, you think about a company as big as Eddie Bauer with how many resources they have and how much money they have and how big their list probably is they could be doing a lot better. And a lot of up and coming D2C brands do the same thing. And so if you can uh, optimize your creative, you'd see some incredible results. And I don't think there's anything, I don't think anybody would argue how important creative is. Um, so this is, uh, so according to Nielsen, about 50% of creative performance comes from, or excuse me, ad performance comes from campaign or comes from creative. And that's from a survey that, or from an article that they released in 2017 and from a study that was done like a decade earlier. And I think in the times of iOS 14, we would agree that that number is probably a lot higher than 50%, yet creative is incredibly under-optimized in the email channel for so many brands. And so what does it look like done well? Well, it's not just selling a product all the time. You're also integrating social and building community. So using a concept like social commerce. And in this example, we're drawing people in with a TikTok while we're also running a promotional sale. So we draw them in with a TikTok. We're building community. People get excited about the emails. And then we have the promo at the bottom and we end up seeing a lot of revenue from these emails. It's funny, like the less you try to sell, the more revenue you end up generating a lot of the time. And we find by even just improving creative over the course of six months, we'll see engagement increase. So we have more people opening and clicking on our emails. And then we'll see revenue increase without having to send more content by just sending more emails that people actually want to get. 
And so even back to that ballsy example, even the creative is personalized. If you're a member of their rewards program, you're getting the exact points that you have in your account. Like that email can only go to you. And that's why it converts so well is because it's so timely. It's so spot on that it works really well. It's like the Facebook ad that, uh, you know, heard you through your phone and you're like, oh, I really need a new mattress. And then all of a sudden you have all these mattress recommendations that you didn't know existed. You can do the same thing with email. Like we need to start freaking people out with email instead of just sending every single day, like a new offer that it's like, like we're sending a mail catalog or something, which a lot of brands do. Uh, they send email, like it's like a newspaper ad. And so the next strategy here is data. Uh, so, so many brands have a ton of data and very few people use it. We have all these dashboards. We don't really look at them or we look at them and then we don't understand what the data actually means and we don't take action based on the data. And so by understanding and optimizing your, uh, your life cycle and CRM data from your email and text program, you can see a lot better results uh, from these channels. So when thinking about iOS 15 rolling out this, uh, later this fall, this summer, you should be thinking about how you can maximize open rates by setting benchmarks and testing your subject lines, pre-header text, send days and times from names, figuring out where your top revenue is coming from, figuring out a new segmentation strategy based on who's actually buying from those emails. Um, and the next piece comes to a more strategic um, shift that a lot of brands need to, need to make is really understanding and building your email program around your customer journey. A lot of people ask me like, hey, Dylan, what's, a, what's the best number of abandoned cart emails to send? Or what's the best abandoned cart time to send an email? It really depends. Like, are you selling phone cases or are you selling a mattress? It's going to be very different. But when you actually align your email program through, um, throughout the customer journey and life cycle and you use it to accelerate buyer behavior that already exists, that's when the magic happens. You can't create buyer behavior, uh, but you can accelerate it by putting the right content in front of them. And that's what's so powerful about email. And then the next piece, which is really important, which is a shift a lot of brands need to make as well. It's something we really try to help our clients with is like slowing down and being more strategic and thinking not just one step ahead, but 10 steps ahead, 10 weeks ahead, six months ahead, um, and really creating a plan for measuring success in a post iOS 15 world on the email channel. So are you going to be measuring click rate? Are you going to be measuring conversion rate? Are you going to be measuring revenue in terms of what does good engagement look like? How do you know when to remove somebody from your list? How do you know when somebody is going to lapse? How do you know if email is actually successful as a channel. Um, and so just coming up with a new plan for measuring success. And a lot of brands really don't even have a plan for measuring success. It's just like, you know, email is doing good enough. We see some revenue for it from it. Like if we need some revenue, we shoot out an email. Uh, but slowing down and being more strategic and using your data to really craft a, a long-term strategy is going to drive so much more revenue for you in the long term and make your life a whole lot easier. And it's going to create a better customer experience for your customers because they're not just going to get like, you know, random discount on a Tuesday because your sales are low. And then it just screws up your whole customer journey <laughs> and probably long-term profitability too, uh, which I know John has lots of opinions on. Um, and so bonus tip, launching SMS. Um, so a lot of brands are really afraid to launch SMS um, or if they do use it, they just kind of like send way too aggressively. And so the way we think about SMS is it's a really great channel that cuts through the noise. And if you don't have it, you need to add it. But um, you got to do it smart. You have to be thoughtful. Once again, it goes back to quality over quantity. You don't want to be texting everybody every single day. Um, and you also, what's great about SMS is it's cutting through the noise because so many people open it. If you do it right, you can see a lot of revenue without a huge list. And so this is the perfect time to start growing that list. Uh, and so for example, this brand here, we're seeing 1.6 million a year in revenue, almost 140,000 a month in revenue just from SMS from a list that was only 30,000 subscribers that we built in less than six months. Um, and so, but once again, it comes back, you've got to do it right. Um, if you're afraid of doing it right, we can help you launch it and do it in a thoughtful way that's not going to annoy your customers. There's definitely a balance to it and email, uh, like we talked about, but personalization is key again. But if you do it right, you can drive a lot of revenue without hurting the customer experience. And so if all of these things that I just mentioned, like create a lot more questions for you and you want to learn more about how we could potentially help you email and SMS for high growth D2C brands. It's all we do. Uh, we're a top Clavio, top attentive partner. And if you want to learn more about how we can help and jump on the phone with me and my team, you can do that at waybreak.co slash call. And we're also going to be following up with some of our Black Friday, Cyber Monday resources afterwards for to prepare you throughout the season 
um, as we continue. And then at the end of this uh, presentation, I think we're also going to do a Q&A. So if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A tab and we'll make sure to uh, check in with those at the end. Awesome. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, some great results there. It's always fun to see that uh, and catch up. As you mentioned, we've uh, we've done podcasts together, et cetera, but it's been a while. So uh, great to see that. Well, uh, coming off of email marketing, uh, I really wanted to just emphasize that once you get people to your site, your marketing has won, right? You're it's really time at, at, at that point to stop marketing and start selling. And to do that, you really need to be thinking about serving your customers' needs. So how do you do that? Especially in this privacy era that is really causing havoc for driving traffic. Well, you focus on optimization. So this is an ROI calculator on uh, you know, conversion optimization showing that really small changes can have massive results here, especially during something like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, when volume is that much higher. So this is really less about testing and more about just maximizing your opportunity over this time frame. And this type of traffic and customer is very different than what you see over the rest of the year, right? They're much more intent based. And that means that you have a higher opportunity to convert folks here when it's done right. So this is showing pretty clearly just what a, a 20, a point, a quarter of a percent, I should say 0.25% improvement can mean in such a high traffic period like the holidays. So for the quickest impact, we really want you to focus on your purchase funnel and your offer. So you mentioned, Dylan, I, I have some very specific thoughts on discounting. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But specifically, I want to talk about three pages as well. Uh, we're going to talk about the home page, product page, and your checkout. And uh, I want to explore both some obvious wins and low-hanging fruit that anyone can benefit from and take advantage of during this time. So starting with the home page, it's probably the most visited page on your site. It definitely should be. Uh, and that means it's probably the area where you stand to gain the most, right? By making small and just incremental improvements here. So really, there's a handful of things that you should be thinking about, and you could do pretty quickly between now and uh, when you need to have things in order for your high sales season. So first is perform what we call a five-second test. This is where you gather first impressions and make sure your main value proposition is super clear. Five-second testing, there's a lot of resources to do this, but really what you're going to do is just show your homepage to a consumer, uh, somebody who fits your ideal customer profile for five seconds, and then take it down and ask them, what did you notice? What popped off the screen? Uh, what would you think would be the first action you would take? You'll be shocked at what you learn. Uh, it's a really great way to get some perspective here. You can also focus your navigation on commercial links. What do I mean by that? Well, your navigation should be doing two things. It should be selling, of course, but helping people to understand what products you sell and how you're going to help solve that pain or need. So get rid of the brand links here, the things like our blog or about us, things that are even higher up the funnel than your shopping pages really drive people to those areas and uh, and take the utility links out. What do I mean by utility links? Things like your account, uh, things of that sort should go off into a separate section of your navigation. And then make sure on your homepage that you have clear and consistent call to actions across the entire page. So what do I mean by this? Well, you can see in this example from one of our clients, Laird Superfoods, that um, we've got really good results by how, using a very consistent button style throughout the entire page and making sure that it's easy for people to find the products that are best for them and know where to click. Uh, you've really got to tell consumers what you want them to do. And then just remove the unnecessary distractions. What do I mean by that? Well, pop-ups that show up immediately upon page load, uh, huge distraction, uh, really degrading to your brand. And then recently bought widgets that come up out of the out of the bottom corner and say, you know, um, so-and-so from Miami bought this product two hours ago. Consumers don't trust in that anyways, and it ends up being a, uh, a distraction pretty clearly. So eliminate some of those things. As we move on to your product page, uh, we really want to try to earn the business of the customer here. 
All right, so every decision that we're gonna make on this page is the difference between an add to cart or a bounce. And so you wanna do a handful of things. Ensure that your language and your copywriting are customer focused, not this technical jargon that only an employee of the brand would understand. Uh, one of our clients, uh, BPN or Bear Performance Nutrition, when they originally came to us, was was really focused on those these um, high impact terms that really only they would know or a scientist would know. We really want to help them to bring that down to something that is uh, for the uh, everyday athlete who's going to be using their products, and then ensure that your product photos are, are and videos are really consistent, right? And show the product in use whenever possible. Uh, that is really going to drive engagement and get people to stick around on that page a little bit more. Uh, and then proactively address concerns and objections. So one of the first things we found with this product was that people didn't know how many servings that it had. So we made that really front and center here that you know each one has 27 servings, for instance. Um, and then from there, uh, earn the trust and, and build purchasing confidence through social proof. You can see here they have a lot of professional athletes use their products. So we brought in an NFL football player um, and made sure that, um, you know, that their experience was shared uh, on here through social proof. Looking at the checkout page, the third area I really want to focus on. And this is something that you should always be asking yourself. How can you make this process as frictionless as possible for your customers? Things like free shipping. How many times have you gone into a shopping cart and added things to the cart, gone through that whole decision-making process, spent minutes of your life on this website, and then you get there and you're like, oh man, I got to pay 20 bucks for shipping. I mean, even $4.99, whatever it is, and you weren't expecting that, it could be a real drag. So really what you want to do is... Um, ideally offer free shipping or even offer it over a defined cart value. That can really be something that you play with to increase your average order value as well. Uh, and then hide the discount field. One thing we see quite often is that there's these referral codes or discount codes that people have and they have the field open. All that is is an invitation for people to leave your site and go to these discount sites or go to Google and type in your domain plus coupon code or referral code, et cetera. What happens is they start looking for these codes. They come back to your site, try two or three, then they don't work because they weren't really valid codes to begin with uh, or they're expired codes. Next thing you know, they think they're not getting the best discount and so they leave. They're just like, hey, I know there's a better price and Often, if I leave, I'm going to get an abandoned cart email with a discount code anyway, so they just jet. Um, and then potentially you lose them for good and your cart abandonment rate is pretty high. So from there, um, you should also really be implementing a one-page checkout and one-click checkouts. So use things like Apple Pay, uh, Shopify has their Shop Pay, a few other things that really allow consumers to uh, make that frictionless to buy. Now... As Dylan mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, I have some pretty, um, you know, thoughts, uh, defined thoughts on promotions versus discounts. Really what you want to do here is uh, think about what your promotion or your offer is going to be to customers, which really brings me to that debate around discounting versus promotions or offers. I'm a firm believer that discounting isn't optimization, it is margin drain. Discounting leads with a price. It's always a dollar or percentage off. A promotion or an offer leads with the value that you're providing and the value of your product. And the psychological difference there is a huge one, when it, especially as traffic volume increases and people are thinking about these, uh, these offers around uh, you know, Cyber Monday, etc. So Instead of a discount this holiday season, I really implore you to lead with value and try an offer. That could be something like free gift with purchase. It could be something like buy one, get one free, or uh, free shipping and free returns. Or it could be bundling, right? Where uh, you can see a bunch of these offers here where you get a free year of blades or free shipping, uh, risk-free trials. These are all offers that perform extremely well but don't degrade your brand by doing a percentage or dollar off. And if you need more ideas around this, go to our site, thegood.com, um, click on insights, and then just search for promotions or discounts, and you'll get guides that we have up there. Uh, there's several of these guides around uh, discounting. And uh, actually what I can do really quickly here, 
is even paste these links in there. So um, some great articles there. Now, um, so the next steps you can do right now to make sure you have the best Black Friday and Cyber Monday is get your campaign right. Nail down your offer, focus on promotions versus discounts. Uh, you can also audit your key pages and make a prioritized to-do list. Uh, the best way you can do that is get a conversion growth assessment from our team at The Good and then quickly implement those changes on these key pages. Make, you know, So many brands come to The Good and they get these assessments and audits and then don't make the changes in time for the holidays because they have so many other things come up. It's really important that you take action after you do that. So really quickly, where do we go from here? Well, you can uh, download a book, a uh, very, very tactical book. This has uh, been something that has uh, sold very, very well for us, but uh, you can get a free copy today. Use the code uh, BFCM2021, thegood.com slash book. Um, and then also you could get a conversion growth assessment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and we'll be sending attendees a code either later today or first thing tomorrow morning uh, with a code for a special rate for an assessment for attendees. And we'll also include the book and all the offers from Dylan and Emily as well in these emails. And then you can always email me directly if you have questions. I read every email. I do my best to respond. Uh, feel free to reach out and ask any questions. Uh, thank you uh, for your time today. Emily, on over to you. All right, let's do it. Thanks for having me again. Some uh, great insight from the email marketing and website design. So excited to talk more about post-purchase. Um, so Carthook is leading the way to add uh, real one-click post-purchase offers. So we've already produced the most post-purchase, it's a tongue twister, post-purchase upsell revenue of any Shopify app. And we kind of attribute that success to being uh, our five years, almost six years as industry leaders with Shopify stores. So why do post-purchase offers matter? And have you added them to your Shopify store yet? If you're answering no, you're missing an opportunity to create new revenue and boost your AOV. Um, and if you make the right kind of post-purchase offers, you can do something equally important connect with your customers and make them love your brand for the long term. So increasing your LTV is huge. As customer acquisition costs continue to increase, uh, many Shopify stores are doubling down on their existing customers. So post-purchase upsells are one of those key strategies to do just that because they increase both your AOV and your LTV. So when it comes time to growing your online store, increasing your average order value or your AOV should be your top priority. Without significant AOV, your operational costs like your shipping, your email marketing costs uh, will eat up your profit margins. And if you catch a larger AOV, you'll increase both your profit dollars and percentage for each order. Uh, which will give you more runway to invest in customer acquisition initiatives and strategies. So today uh, I'll cover how to get the most out of post-purchase offers. The tips that I'll be sharing have led to results like a 41% increase in revenue per customer and achieving around a 30% conversion rate on upsells. On average, our Shopify merchants using card hook post-purchase offers uh, tend to see around a 15% conversion rate on offers, and they can expect an increase of around 10% uh, in total revenue. So that's huge. It's a huge benefit of adding uh, post-purchase offers to your checkout flow. So what is a post-purchase offer? A uh, offer, it's an offer that your customers see before they leave your store. Uh, think of it right between the checkout. So they completed the checkout page, there's the post-purchase offer, and then the thank you page. Um, it's, a, it's a potent moment. It's a great time to deliver a customized offer. So successful post-purchase offers come in um, all shapes and sizes. You can offer a complimentary product like dog booties to go with a dog sweater, if that's your, your selling item, uh, but many merchants find most success by keeping it super simple, just offering a second version of what they just purchased. 
So why post-purchase upsells increase your AOV? For one, timing. Offers before the checkout could potentially distract your customer, and that could risk that initial purchase. When you give an offer after they check out, so in between the checkout and the thank you pages, you're increasing the chance that they'll accept. Uh, so the second point, the reason they'll accept is excitement. So post-purchase timing is uh, a special moment. The customer trusts your brand enough to make that initial purchase. Uh, so they might be riding off of that shopper high, that euphoria that comes with getting something that they initially wanted. So why not use this as, as the opportunity for something more? And the third point is one click, less hassle. There's no need to, for your shopper to re-enter payment or shipping information. So if you're still on the fence about post-purchase offers, uh, here's three, or three reasons why that they work. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast through these. <laughs> so there's no risk of the upsell backfiring. Your customer is already checked out there's far less friction. Before one-click uh, offers existed, most post-purchase upsells happened in an email after the purchase or cart abandonment email, follow-up emails. This meant customers had to go through multiple steps to accept the upsell. So they had to open an email, they had to read the email, they had to click on a button, they had to then re-enter in their payment details. Now customers can literally accept and pay with a one click. Um, and then you have the ability to be uh, hyper relevant. Post purchase uh, upsells take advantage of key data, what the customer just purchased. This data allows the upsell offer to be highly relevant to each customer. In turn, this improves the customer experience. The customer feels more like they're being served. It's a less spammy ex experience. Uh, it's not so much of a salesy pitch. So in the end result is not only is there a higher likelihood uh, for the customer to take the upsell, but there's a higher likelihood that the customer will turn return to your shop again. And that leads back to what I said earlier, it's an incre increase in your brand equity and your customer lifetime value. Here's just a few of the brands that are using the post-purchase offers app. And uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna kind of talk through a few strategies that we've gathered from those brands, but using our test store canopy here. We can pop to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Hero, so using your Hero products uh, is, an, is an obvious first solution. So if you have a bestseller that your customers love, uh, offer it. If your customers love your lip balm that you're selling, have the lip balm be your post-purchase offer. Uh, here at Canopy, customers love our monster plant. So we, choose, we chose to display it as our post-purchase offer. BOGO, buy one, get one. Offer a second item of what your customers just pur purchased. Don't, don't complicate it. The simplicity does sometimes work. And in this scenario, this strategy works ex especially well for uh, brands in the consumable and supplement industry. And to kind of to add to what John had talked about as well, we've got the BOGO and now we have Bundle. Uh, offer a product that's complementary to what was just purchased. So if your shoppers, as an example, you sell socks, uh, or, you, or you're selling shoes, have the offer be a pair of socks. So that complimentary product that goes with the initial order. Another strategy approach is volume. Offer a perk to customers who purchase multiple items or reward customers who might be shopping in bulk with a higher than average spend. And sometimes you just need to clean house clean, move, move inventory in your warehouse. Using a post-purchase strategy to push and move inventory is also a very successful strategy approach. And finally, uh, it's one of my favorite strategy approaches is samples and gifts. It's a really great way to introduce your customers to a new product and then again, boost your customer lifetime value. 
offering, you know, a, a quick example is offering a travel size version of the product that they just bought, it's like a small ber- version of uh, vitamins in a different flavor than what they just purchased or a gift offer, offering a free gift to a customer. Uh, again, it's gonna boost your customer loyalty. Think of it along the lines of offering a package of eye cream for a dollar if they purchase a hundred dollars or more of a certain product. Uh, the sample isn't gonna give a huge AOV boost, but it will be worth the effort if it creates a repeat customer. And strategy, how to build offers that convert. So optimizing your offer for mobile, huge. At least 45% of customers are checking out on their phones. I would make, I would say 100% of my purchases from my phone. Carthook offers includes a mobile preview page that allows you to check your final offer page to make sure it's rendering properly for mobile users super important once you're building your funnels to make sure you're also testing to make sure they are rendering properly. And then uh, another obvious win in the strategy side is including a countdown timer uh, on your offer pages. That builds in that sense of urgency, quite literally is showing a clicking top like clock that's meant to kind of build this uh, FOMO. You know, they don't wanna miss out on this offer. And then social proof, such an easy way. Social proof sells, including customer reviews on your offer page will help convert that order. And finally, be sure to pay attention to the copy. The copy of your offers is is critical to conversions as they're the first thing that your customer is gonna read. And if your customer isn't convinced by the headline, that's probably, probably gonna be the last thing that they'll read too, because they're just gonna close out. So using copy that converts uh, and adds a sense, or conveys a sense of urgency, uh, you know, of the freedom of choice has been shown to quadruple the number of people who purchase. So for example, you might go with a headline that starts with, it's up to you. So putting it back on the shopper. So incorporate direct second person pronouns, you uh, to make offers feel more personal. You know, an example what we use on our canopy site is weights. There's a special offer to go with your monster plant. So we're, we're tying it into their initial purchase and making kind of hopefully incentivizing with that FOMO fear that the offer is too good to miss up. So again, why, why cart hook post-purchase offers? So as I mentioned before, we are a true one-click post-purchase offers app that works with Shopify mer- merchants. Um, Shopify brands have processed uh, over $181 million in post-purchase revenue with our app. And again, I kind of have to lean that into kind of our five years experience uh, in the industry and our solid partnership with Shopify that continues to add to the product and give uh, updates and products to requirements that are needed to help brands be successful with their offer strategy. So most merchants, again, will see around a 15% conversion rate on post-purchase offers and around a 10% uh, total lift in revenue. Uh, we have flexible pricing plans that are, are, are designed to fit every merchant's need. And a big thing of, kind of what John had touched on a little bit when it comes to the checkout is our app supports ShopPay. ShopPay is huge in the Shopify ecosystem. It's their top performing uh, process, converting processor. So obvious win for your Shopify store is to make sure you have ShopPay enabled to allow to streamline your checkouts and also offer post-purchase offers. And then we're flexible. We have multi, multi-language support. Offer pages can be translated into multiple different languages. And a few roadmap teasers, things that we're excited about coming down the pipeline are A-B testing and subscriptions. Um, I have a lot of thoughts around upsell to subscriptions. That's another time, but that's a great way to also increase your customer lifetime value is uh, upselling to a subscription. 
All right, that was fun. I, I hope you guys found a lot of insightful information around post-purchase offers. Uh, now is the time to start thinking about your Black Friday, Cyber Monday strategy. And if you have questions about implementing uh, offers in your funnel, reach out to the CartHook team. You can get in touch with us at carthook.com. And we have a 14 day no risk trial for you to test things out. So thank you. Awesome, thanks everyone. That was full of really valuable nuggets of Black Friday, Cyber Monday insights, and also just general e-commerce insights and value practices. Um, so we're gonna open up to questions. If anyone has any, please feel free to drop them in the chat or into the Q&A function on the webinar. Um, we'll just wait a minute or two, see if anyone has any questions. Just make sure if you're sending them to the chat um, to send them to the everyone in the dropdown. I have a, I have a question for John about Q4 conversion rate optimization. So like what ends up happening is like people start adding all these banners and magical bells and whistles to their site come November. Like what's the impact of that? Is there 80, 20, like one banner or like what? You know, because there's shipping times, there's these deals going on, like how much info should we cram up there? Um, <laughs> and yeah. what did we learn last year from like shipping times and how important is that info in, in conversions for, for November? Yeah, it seems like the shipping has um, normalized a little bit now, which is, which is great to see, but it's always worth setting expectations. Um, the last thing you want to do is have somebody over a holiday order something and not get to the door in time, right? So really want to make sure that you're setting expectations along the way. And I think if you, if as long as you take it that angle, I'm trying to be helpful and set expectations, not apply pressure, right? So there is the urgency aspect of, Hey, today's the last day to get it in time for, for Christmas. Right. But if you play on that throughout the entire you know, uh, holiday season, then it's going to be an old hat and people aren't going to respond as well. Right. So I think it's, it's the, what works, we find what works very, very well is using that as, um, I'm being helpful, not as trying to push people to purchase right now. And that seems to perform better. And it's just a tone and, and copywriting angle. Um, and there's actually a great resource for shipping times, uh, through ShipBob. Uh, my understanding in, in talking with their CMO Casey is they're going to be doing this again this year, which is um, a daily updated tracker of ship times. Um, so, you know, for all four major carriers, UPS, FedEx, DHL, and USPS uh, here in the United States, they're really going to be publishing, hey, so a two day on FedEx is actually delivering in four days right now. Um, and the average is, you know, like 40% get there on time, whatever it might be whatever those numbers are. So uh, you can set some better expectations with your, uh, with your customers. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you, Dylan. What, um, if I'm looking to send emails over a holiday, what should I be thinking about in terms of the timing of those? Would you recommend, you know, I heard you say earlier, the brand that sent less but better emails perform better. But over the holidays, should I be thinking about sending an email every week or once a day as we get closer? I, it, it seems like as a consumer, my email inbox fills up pretty quickly during that time because everyone starts sending. What do you see performs best? What, what kind of cadence? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the important thing is the biggest lever you can pull leading up to Black Friday is by sending really good email throughout the course of the year. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to keep your open rates high come Black Friday because people are going to be looking for your specific brand when all of a sudden, you know, TJ Maxx somehow has your email from like 10 years ago when you gave it to get like 10% off that order. Like everyone's emailing you, but because you have a great relationship in your inbox with that brand, you're going to open more. Um, mm -hmm. Ramping send volume is good during Q4 and we do recommend it just because we do see a decrease in open rates because of the increase uh, in send volume across the board. Um, and we find that like typically, I mean, open rates can go down a lot, um, you know, on Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So that's why we see some brands launch promotions earlier. That's one way you can get around it. 
But the biggest lever you can pull is really starting now, building an awesome engaged list. Like <clears throat> that client who's only sending four emails a month right now, like they're going to ramp and they're going to be sending a lot more over time as we get into Q4. But those emails are going to do a lot better. And they're, they're, they're not going to exactly maintain just because of the increased competition. Like we'll see clients who their open rates will get slashed in half just because they're in a more competitive industry where, you know, especially if you're in like fashion or apparel, right. Um, and you have like a more generic customer versus like a really targeted, like more boutique kind of brand. Um, but yeah, definitely ramp volume in terms of like what the magic number is. Like you don't want to fry your list and then yeah. have a, a lot of attrition and unsubscribes, but you know, be top of mind. So what that looks like varies for a lot of brands. I mean, sometimes you can send up to twice a day if it makes sense. Uh, you can resend to people who haven't bought too. That's another key is like segment out people who have bought. So even pre Q4 too, like if somebody bought November one and your sale launches November 15, like probably don't want to let them know what they just bought two weeks ago is now on sale for, you know, 50% off if they didn't hear your, uh, uh, your part about how to actually put together a great promotion and they're just, you know, discounting their products. Um, but yeah, they, they'll, you know, the answer with everything is it depends, but definitely ramp volume come Q4, but send good now and it'll, it'll pay off later. Yeah. Get out of that dreaded promotions tab now, if you can, right. Then it would be <laughs> better later. Right. Awesome. Yeah. That's a good point. That was a question that I had for you too, Dylan. It's like, we have conversations with merchants that, you know, are well-established brands to merchants that are just getting started. And so on those just getting started brands, it's kind of, they come to us and are looking for a more holistic approach to their strategy. So it's outside of post-purchase offers. And so it's interesting on the email side of like helping them, yes, build your list. So it starts at top of the funnel, driving traffic to your site. You've got to have orders first. Now that you have those orders, what are you doing to nurture them. And so it's, it's, I'm take the, my takeaway from this is, is we should incorporate that email marketing strategy is really important to, you know, I'm, I'm huge on the customer lifetime value of, of really keeping your shoppers engaged and returning. So start sooner rather than later is, is such a, a key takeaway. Yeah. And that's another great point too, is the, the stage of your brand. Like if you're doing a million a year and you're you know, maybe one or two people on the marketing team and you don't have a lot of resources, like send as much as you can. That doesn't have to be daily. Uh, mm -hmm. It can just be like the main ones. But if you're a large established brand, if you're doing over a hundred million a year, like you can get more granular and segmentation, actually understand these people want to get emails daily. These people want to get emails weekly. And you can start to segment based by um, uh, the behavior of like, if people actually want to get your emails and create different frequency tracks. I mean, that's like way, way down the road when you have a lot of subscribers. That's the other thing. Don't get too advanced where you're trying to do that. Mm -hmm. You only have a list of a hundred thousand people. So that's why it's really hard to give blanket advice because it really depends too. Yeah. Yeah. But it, that is a good, a good point of like, you're, you don't, if you're just getting started, you don't have to do it all. Like take the baby steps in that approach and start building your email list, build that engagement, get, uh, you know, people to your store to buy stuff. It's, it's don't implement your email marketing with SMS. Like everything doesn't always have to happen right away. So for sure. Awesome. All right, great. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat right now, but everyone, please feel free um, to reach out to the team on social media or via the websites that were shared today in the presentation. We'll be reaching out later today or tomorrow, as John mentioned, with the recording and with um, some of the offers that were presented here. Thank you so much to everyone for joining and especially to our presenters. This was so much fun and a great kickoff to the holiday season and holiday prep. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Dylan and Thank Emily you. for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me and thanks for putting this together. Appreciate yeah, this it. was great. Thanks all. We'll Bye. See you soon. See ya.